You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 36 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name is Jonathan Wiley, and this is Mindy Carney. Melinda Lynn. Melinda Lynn. Yeah, we were just talking about your your middle name there, Mindy, yeah. weren't we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Things we didn't know about Mindy Carney. Oh, there are plenty. That could be a whole podcast all by itself. That would be things we shouldn't know about Mindy Carney. Yes, right, probably. But, yeah. So uh, this is kind of a fun episode. Code.org is coming up. Code.org. Hour of Code. Hour of Code is coming up. Hour of Code. <laughs> Hour of Code is coming up. And so um, our... We have a special guest with us later on in the show. It's going to be sharing some stuff about Code.org and the Hour of Code. But before yeah. that... Before that, we before got that. some news and follow-up. Yeah, let's do it. And I think the first one on this oh. list is yours. Yes, of course it is. Um, so some Seesaw updates. Uh, just this last week, Seesaw released that uh, teachers are now able to schedule activities, which is really great if you're trying to work ahead. Um, so that those activities can be pushed out at a specific time that you needed them. You can also now share activities with other teachers, um, which is kind of exciting. So gonna going to see maybe some more collaboration with teachers. I've seen them starting to kind of um, share links and things like that of um, the activities that they've been creating. So many hands make light work. I like it. Yeah. So just taking that um, activities thing to its Holy natural level. next step. Yeah. Yeah. Sharing activities with other teachers and scheduling activities. Yeah. So good. Yeah. I like that. I do too. Mm -hmm. And I think once again, Seesaw does a great job of um, listening to teacher feedback and they've been clamoring really for the scheduling um, of posts for a while now um, and then activities came out and so they added it to that and then the ability to share activities really is just it's you know. like CISO is becoming a learning management system I, it is almost, I know I don't know can we, can say, we that? say that I don't know I don't think they would call themselves a learning management system yet but Not they yet. sure are wearing the disguise <laughs> of an LMS right now so all right. Well, I'll move on to the second thing on the list, which I, I kind of kept cryptic from you, Mindy, just to uh, see what your reaction to this would be like. But okay. um, yesterday, Apple were here at Grant yes, Wood right. doing a workshop. Right. Uh, Tim Cook and Johnny Ive and all the guys were here. And okay, those guys weren't there, but um, <laughs> some people were representing them here at Grant Wood and talking about new changes to iOS and things that are going on mm -hmm. with the Mac um, for teachers. And one of the things they said kind of um, surprised me a little okay. bit, but, and I hadn't thought about it before, but it made complete sense. So, Mindy, do you do your kids have iPads at home? They do not. Don't have iPads at home? No. Oh, okay. No. So this might not be a great tip for you, but for those okay. parents who have kids who have access to iPads at home, mm -hmm. Apple Classroom. Okay. So Apple Classroom, you know, is a system that you can use to monitor the iPads in your room. You right. can see everybody's screens. Mm -hmm. You can lock screens. You can push them into apps. Uh -huh. He said they've got parents doing Apple Classroom at home. Oh, Isn't that a fun thing? What is. are my kids doing on their iPad? Where they're I in know their exactly bedroom what they're whatever. doing on their iPad. Well, there you go. Yeah, you can huh. see their screen. You can lock their screen. Yeah. You can see activity history of how long they've been using certain apps and what they've been doing in different apps. And right. So mm -hmm. Apple Classroom for parental controls, I thought was kind of a, a neat idea. It is. Hmm. Oh. So there you go. Yeah. Something different. Yeah, a little twist on Apple Classroom. I like that. And just to give a very quick additional iOS uh, update, Google has added drag and drop to uh, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Google Photos, and some Google apps like that. So if you, you like me, enjoy dragging and dropping between apps, then uh, you can now drag and drop into a Google Doc, which means you could have like Safari up on one half of your iPad and Google Doc on the other half. And when you're doing some research or taking some notes, you can drag things from one app to the other. It's nice. I think so. You know, when we um, did the iPad 
and I think we, you, we've talked about this, but when we did the iPad challenge where we only used the iPad for a week, that was mm-hmm. one of the things that I really missed was being able to like, drag, just and drag drag stuff between. into it. Yeah. And so... Eh. That was pre-iOS 11. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of those challenges, you reminded me today I have still not done the yeah. Chromebook challenge. Yeah, you need to do it. Maybe before We're going to need a date. Before sir. the year is out, I think maybe yeah. we should do that. Or I should we, do that. We, I've done it. Okay. When I spilled coffee all over my computer, remember? I do remember that, yeah. yes. Yeah, so I, I did Chromebook for about two weeks. I really liked it. It yeah. made me a believer in Chromebooks. Before then, I was like, eh, I don't know. But I'm like, okay. yeah, I still pull it out. It's much more lightweight. All I'm right. going to put it on my to-do list then. Yes, okay. Um, so my... Um, little follow-up is on our thankful episode i talked about matt miller and my follow-up to that is that um, i kind of forgot that i'd signed up for this and then um, i came across it again is that there is a um, ditch that textbook digital summit and it's a free virtual event Um, it opens on ooh december december 15th (laughs) I should know this. December 15th, I think, to December 31st. Um, is that nine days? That's not nine days. It's about 16 Math days. Math is hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So anyway, I'll put the link in the show notes, but you can sign up for this um, and just kind of, you know, get a little PD over your summer. So- summer. Christmas. <sighs> Christmas. <laughs> over so, your christmas break so is this kind of like asynchronous learning or do you have to be online at certain times in order to uh enjoy the learning you get from these people No, i think you can i've never done this before so this is new to me um but i think that you like it's stuff that is ahead of time and then you just can go and watch the videos when you want to watch them so it's all on your own time and then I don't know anything about this because I this wasn't one of the reasons I was doing it, but that you can get professional development credits. Oh, really? Yeah. After you've completed a presentation and gone through um, and watched it, you can generate a certificate for you to submit to your school district. I don't know how that would work here in Iowa, but... Interesting. Um, okay, so I have the dates now. December 15th to December 23rd. The videos are available until December 31st. So tell me about some of the good people that are going to be presenting at Ditch Summit there because some, yeah. some people we've already mentioned yes. in previous episodes, I think. Um, so I'm going to look and see Eric Kurtz, um, Michael Matera. I think we've mentioned him, yes. Matt Miller, um, some other people. Who else? Are oh, you pointing out a name that you want me to mention? John Carippo. Carippo do you know him? Yeah, he's oh, very just... big on the West Coast. Um, oh, okay. John Carippo. Oh, I wish so. I was on the West Coast. Um, yeah, so just some bigger names um, of people that you could check out and um, learn from. Good, good. Yeah. Lots of good people. Yeah, so you do have to sign up for it. Um, and like I said, I'll put the uh, notes or the link in the show notes, but it's all over Twitter right now. So if you're a Twitter user, you've probably come across it. Okay, last thing I put on the list here, I'm going to encourage Mindy to click on it while I give it some context and let her have a quick spin through this because I don't think she's seen it. But I came across this article I thought it was just kind of fun or interesting. It's, you know, getting to the end of the year where uh, you get these best of 2017 yes, right. lists and all this kind of stuff. This one was in Time Magazine. It was the 25 best inventions of 2017. I think it was just kind of a curious or an interesting list of technologies, some of which you may not even have heard of before, mm-hmm. um, but some that may work your way into your classroom pretty soon. Scroll back up. Look at oh, that ice oh, cream. okay. Was that for real, Gelfry ice cream? I thought it was an advertisement. No, that's for real. Someone has created ice cream that's got like 280 calories per pint. It's called Halo. Yeah. $6. Flavor-packed, low-sugar ice cream with no more than 360 calories per pint. So you literally can sit down and have an and entire whole pint, pint and not feel too bad about yourself. It's enriched with protein. Yeah. So they have all kinds of stuff on here. They've got like, you know, mugs that heat your coffee just right. There's um, there's a new VR headset from um, Oculus who, you know, if you've ever used these like things from Oculus or HTC Vive before, they are usually hooked up to a computer, but they've moving towards a system where you have these standalone headsets and the computer is in the headset and you're doing VR, like, wireless, basically, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. So they got all kinds of 
crazy and unusual um, things on here that you may not have heard of, but just it's an interesting look at technology and what's been going on this year and how some of this stuff is going to uh, make it into the classroom, I'm sure. Some of it is probably not going to make it into the classroom, but, you know, there's like new drones yeah. and all kinds of stuff. The on Tesla. There. The Tesla, yeah. yeah. I'd like to say that would be my next car, but I don't think it will Company be. Company vehicle. No. Yeah, Grant Wood should get a few of those, shouldn't Come on, they? Grant Wood, get with the times. Yeah. Uh-huh, that's funny. So hmm. there you go, 25 best inventions of 2017. Yeah. Um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes, and if you are curious and want to check out and get a glimpse of the future, you can see that right here. All right, so should we move on to the main course? I think it's about that time. All right, so today... Samantha Dalby is here with us, and um, in case you uh, missed her first appearance on the show, Samantha is a K-12 education coordinator at New Bohemian Innovative Collaborative, um, and she really right now is helping students implement um, STEM into their curriculum in a fun and engaging way. Uh, she's also a pretty strong partner with Code.org, um, and so she shares a lot about Code.org with our area schools and students. Um, and providing opportunities for classrooms with workshops and summer challenges, things like that. So we'd really like to welcome Samantha Dalby to the show. All right, so today we have, um, we're welcoming back, I should say, Samantha Dalby from Nubo Co. And uh, we asked her to come in and talk with us a little bit because um, the Hour of Code week is upon us. And we wanted to just kind of talk a little bit with her about what's going on right now and um, what she has new to share with us. So welcome. Thanks for being on the show again. Thanks for having me back. Oh, yeah. I think we talked to Samantha. I looked it up. It was in March this year. Of this year? Yeah. Jeez, where's the time go? <laughs> the time has gone fast, but yeah. it's been too long since we've talked to Samantha, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. always. <laughs> I get to hear you guys every time you have a podcast. Oh, <laughs> another loyal listener. Who knew? Sometimes we wonder if they're out there. <laughs> well, maybe before we go too far into this, uh, Samantha, I was reading you won an award recently. Is that right? Yeah, I actually had two this year. Yeah. Two this year? Oh, yeah. I missed one. I just, they're just bulking them up, so I can have a long stretch without any awards for a while. Oh. <laughs> so tell us what you uh, what you were winning this year. Uh, so first I got Kirkwood's All-Star Award for the IT sector. Um, that was, I think, in the spring. And then um, my husband and I both actually got 40 Under 40 for the CBJ this year. Nice. Oh. That's yeah. an award I'm not eligible for anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Old man. Two of the three people in this room could win this still, but uh, not me. <laughs> well, that's exciting. So what does your husband do? Is he, I mean, does he work here at Nubo Code too? Yep, he oh, works at Nubo Code too. Yeah. He works in the Nubo Code part of things. So he's also a software developer. Awesome. Yeah. Huh. Solid team. Yeah. There you go, Team Dolby. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so um, Hour of Code is coming up, and it's that time of year again. Mm -hmm. What what do people need to know about this, Samantha? What do you tell people? Yeah, so um, you don't have to have any experience to do an Hour of Code. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, we always send people to the Hour of Code site, which is hourofcode.com, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of ways that you can get started. There's actually a how-to get started section for teachers or parents or anyone that can check out. Um, and a lot of people think of the like actual coding part of something that, that they can do, but we like to think of it as doing activities that just bring in computer science. So with the younger kids, um, sometimes computers is not a good path to go for mm -hmm. an hour. Um, it may take more than an hour or they might not last an hour with that. So we like to get them up and moving and things. Um, one of the things actually have that you guys can see, oh. um, but others can't. Um, I printed this out because I'm going to be doing a tiny techies class with a preschool in town next oh. uh, year. Cool. And Scratch Junior has uh, printouts of the the physical blocks that they use that drag and drop. Mm -hmm. But you can have the kids put them in order, and if you laminate them, cut them out, and stuff, mm -hmm. then you can just use them over and over. Um, so that's a pretty fun way. And then I like to for the action of that, the teacher actually does or the adult in the room does what the kids oh, program yeah. because the kids love seeing adults be crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, another similar one that I've done, if you don't want to print things out, is just have the kids create a maze with chairs, desks, whatever mm -hmm. you're comfortable with them moving around. 
and decide where the start and end points are. And then they have to give instructions. Mm -hmm. And the adult doing it has to be very specific. So if the student says, go forward, they keep going forward until they run into something or mm -hmm. they take one step, whatever right. it is, like sure. they do that. Or if it says, like, turn around, then you just keep spinning around in a circle. Mm -hmm. And the kids are like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you teach them to be very specific and actually give those step-by-step mm -hmm. -step instructions, which leads into the c coding and computer science. So these are kind of like um, offline activities, basically, mm -hmm. that, you know, people think sometimes to do coding and computer science, I need to be one-to-one, -one, right. or every kid right. needs to have access to a computer or something. But mm -hmm. we can do these... Uh, without having yeah. devices at all. Yeah, we call them unplugged. 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 Mm -hmm. like makes it. sense. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm uh, going into a kindergarten class on um, Monday morning, and I might, I was going to talk about what a bug is and mm -hmm. what actually code means, so that might be a good, yeah, it's a good idea. I like that. Good to see that, that visual representation. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. All right. So let's say um, I have older students. What would be the next step after something like that? Sure. So if you want to do coding, um, again, on the Hour of Code site, they have a ton of different things that are um, student-led tutorials mm -hmm. that can guide them through step-by-step. -step. Some of them are the drag-and-drop blocks for the introductory um, you know, experience. If they've already done a little bit of coding, there are some tutorials on there that will also do like typed coding. Mm -hmm. um, or you can send them to Code Academy or Khan Academy um, with lots of options there as well. Um, but again, I, I think I talked about this last time, find what they're interested in and then gear them towards that. Um, with my daughter, she's in first grade right now. She's done some of the drag and drop stuff. She's not ready for type coding. Mm -hmm. um, but I had this recent parenting frustration with the Christmas gifts we, I mentioned we got. <laughs> and she's into these num num things. Yes, I don't want to bash noms. them, but yes. I was num -num? really. A num num. <laughs> okay, a num num. <laughs> they're like that? little smelly. Um, I smell, they go, they're good smelly. So like yeah. pancake and syrup or something like that. And you stack them on top of one another and they. Yeah. There's a bottom part that actually has like a little motor and it drives around or yeah, know, and some of them are like stamps. Yeah. Okay, I need to hide this from my kids. I yes, guess. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And so I was really frustrated. I'm like, why are you interested in these? But then I took my own advice and was like, all right, how about you create an app to track what num noms you have mm -hmm. and which ones you don't? And then she was like. Okay, well, I don't really want to do that, but I do want to build a game that has Wonder Woman flying in it. And I was like, all right, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like where you're going yes. with this. So I took her interest and then kind of found mm -hmm. what she w wanted to do and then guided her towards something. Um, so what did you use for her to build her app? Scratch. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we found um, an existing um, like child version of Wonder Woman, and mm -hmm. then she got to go in and she could edit the colors. So she changed oh. the color of her outfit and things, and probably spent like 20 minutes doing that. Of course. And then they have tutorials in there as well. And so I kind of let her go through as much as she could, and she got to the point where things were moving, but they were all moving together, like stacked up on each other. So mm -hmm. then I was able to kind of guide her through nice. having a move at different paces. Like super and stuff. mom, right there. <laughs> I'd been like. See you later. <laughs> See you in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I guess that, I mean, it kind of leads into something that I have trouble kind of recommending to teachers, and that's what, what's that transition point between the block coding and the type mm, coding? That's and a good question. It seems like you do one and then you do the next, and there's no kind of in-betweeny kind of, well, maybe there's an in-betweeny transition, but, That is you know. the question. Is there an in-betweeny? Yes, is there an in-betweeny? It's like <laughs> yes. an om-nom. nom <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, so the in between I recommend is finding a tool that lets you flip between the blocks and text. And okay. code.org has that if they want to use it, and you can just go in without using the curriculum and find like their um, game lab, I think is what it's called, and app lab both do that. Hmm. So they can drag the blocks over and then click the button that says show text, and it shows what it is in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they want to go back into the blocks, like if they type something in text and it doesn't quite work, they can flip back. So that's kind of a, a way to transition. Yeah. Um, another one is Code Combat, um, where, and that one has like IntelliSense where it will, if you start typing something, it will give you suggestions on what um, you're, oh. you're going for. So you could start typing move, and it will give you move left, move right, move, mm -hmm. you know, the different options, and then they can just select that instead of typing everything nice. out. So it makes sure that they don't have as many syntax errors. Um, and at that point, what I would recommend is that they're comfortable with reading 
and they're comfortable using the keyboard. Um, mm-hmm. If they're still kind of hunt and pecking, yeah, then it's going to take them a long time. I actually saw a session where a father brought his six-year-old or seven-year-old son in, and he gave them a, him a piece of paper that had the code already on it. And while he was doing his presentation, his son was just typing out exactly what was on the paper. Mm-hmm. And he got like five lines in maybe mm-hmm. after 30 minutes. Hmm. He's like, this is not the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hard work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of the things to look for is if they're comfortable with reading, they have the strong reading skills, and they're comfortable using the keyboard at a fairly quick pace. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they can handle that. Th- then that takes that frustration for that part out. All right, well, let's take it one step further again. Let's say Mindy's going to a high school next week, mm-hmm. and uh, there, there's some older kids there, and they're thinking, I'd like to learn to code. And the question I always, I mean, I, I see these articles on Medium and on social media and stuff like that, and it's like, what's the best language to start with? And mm. Is there a good language to start with, or is there not a good coding language to start with? Start whatever you want to yeah, start. There's or, no one good answer. Um, yeah. I can say that there's a lot of JavaScript out there because that can be used all over the place. Okay. Um, so even like with our adult coding school, that's mainly what it focuses on because you can go into web development, you can go into app development, and you can go a lot of different directions. Um, if it if it needs a compiler, which maybe some people don't know what that is, but if, uh, no, we'll go ahead. And so a compiler is like a <laughs> like a development <laughs> environment. Um, like Visual Studio would be um, a development like location for C sharp or Xcode. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. There what, you go. Why am I here? I don't. <laughs> what are we talking about? Yeah, you're you're here know. to make sure we keep it down. <laughs> yeah. Right, dumb it down for me. Water it down, please. We're going through the spectrum yes, here. Right. No, okay, you know. okay. So that's where you write your code, and then it has to be built. Okay. That can be very frustrating to start with because you're adding another level of complexity in there, mm-hmm. um, and you're, you're debugging not only your code but also potentially the coding environment. Okay. So I would not recommend that as a starting point. Um, most in most cases. Um, there are tons of online development environments that you can find a lot of times for web development. Um, we use um, Thimble for okay. our Girls Code Plus Plus camp, um, and that does HTML, CSS, and you can start doing JavaScript in there. Another one is, I think, Code Pen or Pen Code. I don't remember which order it is. But there's some of those environments. And then with those, you can actually see immediately what it looks like. Um, what your web page would look like. So mm-hmm. that's a great feedback mechanism so that they're not doing all this coding and then nothing happens. Yeah, right. Um, they're, they're seeing that, oh, nothing changed. I must have something wrong or it'll show you an error. So those are great places for older kids to start kind of experimenting and actually get feedback. And with Thimble, they can actually publish their website as well and then share it with parents and friends and things. Nice. So it's a nice feature. That's new. I, <clears throat> Thimble? Yeah. I have to add that one to the show notes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have another question. Um, There's kind of uh, not a personal question, but uh, a question that you get asked a lot and probably one that Mindy gets asked a lot. And when kids start to do some coding, it naturally leads them to think about what they can make. And I often will get a teacher saying, hey, I've got kids that want to make an app. Is there any environments or simulators or or things that kids could do to quote unquote make an app? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> what are they? We need yes. to know. <laughs> yes. So one of them um, would be Code.org's App Inventor. That one has more of a pretty environment. Um, it can do the drag and drop or typing, and they can have it sent to their phone. Yeah. Um, I, I don't remember if that one you can text it to someone. I know some of the Hour of Code tutorials. If you get to the end, like the Flappy Bird one, um, you can actually send your mom or your grandma or someone. Um, a text that lets them play the game on their phone. Hmm. So that for younger kids, that would be an option where they've created that game and they can play it. Mm-hmm. For older kids, the, um, the App Lab or App Inventor um, is also one that you can use um, to create apps. And App Inventor will let you embed like um, web um, pages in there as well, which App Lab does not yet, I don't believe. Um, but it's a little bit more of a clunky UI, so it's not quite as user friendly. It just has more features. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some easy ones to get into that the kids can use. The teachers can still be fairly familiar with, um, and there's some guidance to those as well. I need to go back through my emails and reply to, yeah, all, right, those to all of those teachers <laughs> that are in that one folder. Say, Sorry, like, but now uh, I know. Yeah, Samantha told me <laughs> there's some there's some stuff you can use. Yeah, right.
are there any um, things, and I think we talked about this the last time, but what's going on here at New Boco or what are some things that you offer um, outside of the school hours? So for those kids that maybe are looking or really interested, what are some of the opportunities that you guys offer for them um, outside of school? Sure. So this year we've been trying to do things called Dojo Pro classes. Um, That's kind of the follow-up to our Coder Dojos, which are free introductory um, sessions each month. And the Dojo Pro classes we've offered, um, some development ones, we are trying to do two Girls Code Plus Plus ones each year, each school year now. We just did one in November. Our next one's coming up in February. And that's um, an introductory web development one for middle and high school girls, um, mainly just to focus on them and get them interested. We have women from tech fields that will come and be mentors and, and lead those sessions. Um, And then for anyone, we've got an augmented reality class coming up at the beginning of January, I believe. Mm. We've done a couple of other um, VR, AR stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also did a game development class uh, recently. Nice. Yeah. Mm. And are you... Are you going out to schools as well? Are you doing any like outreach for schools and things like that? Or is that kind of on request or special occasions? Yeah, so... um, I get lots of requests. I bet you do. <laughs> um, and so I mainly do that for like hour of code events and kind of helping and guiding. Um, a lot of times I'll work with teachers if they're looking for something specific um, and I may be able to pop in or not. It's kind of depends on my availability. Um, but I really try and be flexible and, and provide whatever I can um, to help teachers get started because I'm something I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. So um, coming up at Grantwood AA, you are hosting a Code.org event mm-hmm. for administrators and counselors. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So one of the main things that I do is help um, teachers and schools get training on computer science so that it's not just me going around and we can have a big army of people um, teaching computer science. And the administrator counselor meetings are really to educate the target market on what computer science is and what it isn't, Mm -hmm. um, what opportunities there are in Iowa, especially with the legislation that's gone through last year Mm -hmm. that's putting a focus on computer science, kind of things that are moving that direction. And then um, we offer a free uh, year-long professional learning program for teachers. Right now it's middle and high school. Um, The elementary one is a simple one-day workshop. And for the middle and high school teachers, I work with the administrators to understand why it's important for them to have that class, how they can integrate it into their schools, because each school has different issues with master schedules and teacher availability and things like that, and then um, help them prepare to apply for that, um, for spots for that in January. Mm -hmm. Um, So the workshop will actually be talking about computer science how it applies in Iowa, and then we're going to be doing some hands-on activities, which is my favorite part, Mm -hmm. um, where they get to experience some of the lessons and see it's not just coding the whole time. It really talks about ethics. It talks about privacy. It talks about how to work in teams, and there are lots of hands-on and plugged, um, unplugged and plugged uh, (laughs) activities that the, the kids do in the classes. And then I like to open it up for questions because there are always questions about this. It's, um, something that's kind of hitting the educational world stronger right now and Mm -hmm. people a lot of times um, have either barriers in their mind about why they can't do it or they're just not sure how they would do it and so I like to I like to problem solve and figure out how I can take those barriers away for them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this might be a weird question but are there other people like you so like if we have (laughs) listeners like yeah yeah, that's why I said it's kind of a weird question but so like if we have a listener let's say in Kansas or Nebraska or whatever are there other people doing the same things that you're doing are you is this a unique position is this something that's just created here where we're at i mean are can they find these same sort of resources somewhere else i guess is the question yes yeah yeah. so um specific to code.org they have the regional partner program and they have partners i think we're up to like 79 partners maybe now okay including Mm -hmm. hawaii oh i'm really vouching for a yeah right (laughs) transfer (laughs) you guys have got to make it together somewhere yes yeah we meet twice a year we should meet in hawaii I don't have to fly every time. Um, but if they go to code.org site, um, there's, I think it's code.org slash administrators. Okay. Um, they can find information on how to get computer science to the school, and they can track down the regional partner in their area. And if there isn't one in um, the few st- states that don't have one yet or a few areas, then um, they can submit their information and they'll get hooked up with someone that's nice. close by. Good. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
All right. Well, I'm I'm looking at this uh, LED circuit board that's mm-hmm. uh, plugged into your computer here. Uh, you must find all the new toys that uh, Mindy and I don't always get to see. So, um, in terms of you know things that uh, people are using in schools or could use in schools for uh, for helping with programming and robots and all that other cool stuff we talked about last time that we we, we learned about. What was that? The the, the cube. Cubetto. Cubetto. Mm-hmm. Yes, we learned about that last time. Yeah. So, what, what what's new? What should we uh, what should we be paying attention to? Yeah. So this thing is um, along the lines of wearables um, or hardware. You can actually buy these for about twenty dollars on Adafruit. They're called a Circuit Playground, and it's part of Code.org's Computer Science Discoveries curriculum. It's Unit Six, where they work on physical computing. Mm-hmm. Um, it has, as you can see, a, I'll describe it: ring of LEDs. It also has some inputs and outputs. It has. A uh, light sensor, sound sensor, has a buzzer on it. So all kinds of fun things that they can play with and they can program it. And any person can go and buy one and they can use like a Arduino IDE to program it. Um, but Code.org. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Slow down, Samantha. I, I You're a loser. Arduino and then <laughs> so it's an, another again. development environment, okay. um, which would be like type coding. So if you okay. were going to do this for a separate project. But... For people that don't want to dive into that, um, Code.org's web-based curriculum has a tool that's integrated where you can program it with drag and drop blocks or using the type coding. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Yes. And it has the nice thing about what Code.org does is it has the units and lessons that step them through it. So Mm -hmm. it talks about how to interact with an LED, how do you turn it on and off. So it starts from the basics and then it works on up to how you change them. They're actually red, blue, and green LED. LEDs in there, mm-hmm. RGB, and so you can make it change different colors, um, and then, of course, at the end, they can do like a free-for-all project um, where they create whatever they want. I imagine that there will be lots of buzzing. Yes, um, I think yes, so, Yes, so I would yeah. <laughs> <laughs> warn teachers about that. Uh, maybe just snip that part off. Yeah, that. right. <laughs> Oops, it doesn't work. Um, yeah, but this is a really fun way. I, I did... Um, the hardware embedded development. So I really like the physical computing. I like to see things flash and beep mm-hmm. and move mm-hmm. and, and blink and buzz. Um, so that's a, a great way. And I can show you guys, but this is the app that has, um, it's sensing sound, light, and um, temperature on there. And it's just blocks that I've done in there. But if I flip it over to the text, oh, it nice. shows um, what that looks like in text. Cool. That's just what we were talking about. about yeah, the, right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. So you said that you're working on a wearable. What are you What are you working on right now? So I have bought some pieces to make, um, similar to this actually, a yeah. smaller circle that has LEDs and then a controller that I'll be wiring up to the center. And um, I've seen people make like earrings and stuff that's mm-hmm. a little bit bigger than the earrings I wear. Mm-hmm. But I was figuring <laughs> about making um, like a hair piece or something sure. that either I could have and it would look normal and then it's not on, but then it can mm-hmm. also flash for like holidays or something. Right. And then I figured my daughter would also be interested in oh, that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Wonder Woman costume. You know, yes. there you go, like some yes. power bracelets or something. Yeah. Oh, with, yeah. Yeah, that'd yeah, be pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I can make one for my husband to be Iron Man. Oh, yeah. 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 I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe by next year I'll have that done. <laughs> <laughs> Get after it. <laughs> <laughs> so any, anything else we, we should know about? Anything else that's new that's, uh, that's yeah. coming out in terms of like hardware? Because it is, it is nice to see that, you know, that physical version. Instead of just running the code on a computer screen to right. see something move or do or light up mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and be physical that way. Yeah, one thing um, that one of my online friends, I guess, um, yeah. has created, she's from New York, and it's called JewelBots. Okay. Um, and it's, again, it's targeting mostly girls, but anyone can use it. And they're friendship bracelets that are digital. Oh. And they have Bluetooth in them. Mm-hmm. And you can pair them with your friends. And then you can have it do things like when your friend who you have associated with the color red gets near, it'll flash. Oh, so that you know fine. your friend's there. You can send We message. need those for our team. We yes. What are they called? Say Jewel again. bots. Jewel bots. They have like a Merry buy Christmas. one, get one free right now, I think. <gasps> I need my flash red when Mindy gets close. No kidding, warning, like, I just, need to uh, turn whoa, whoa, and go whoa, whoa, the other whoa, whoa, direction. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually I got th- a three pack over the summer, and I'm using it to track my children oh. because my little one likes to run off at playgrounds, and yeah. so I'm working on it so that when she gets out of range, so Bluetooth is like 50 meters, yeah, probably. Um, she gets too far, it flashes her it, color, it and it flashes her. on her. 
so that hopefully she turns around and doesn't keep running away. I like tracking better. <laughs> yeah, good luck with the, uh, the hoping part. <laughs> DHS is showing up at my doorstep right now. Uh-huh. Tracking your children. That's a great idea. I have to look into that. That's kind of a fun. My daughter would love that. All right. All right. What else would we need to know? I mean, any other pearls of wisdom you would like to share on this Computer Science mm -hmm. Education Week? Yeah, so even though it's Computer Science Education Week, I don't want that to be a barrier for people. You can actually do an hour of code anytime during the year. Right. So if you're just Good getting point. this message now and you're like, oh, I missed the boat this year. I guess yeah. I'll have to wait till next year. Oh, no, no, no. no, no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it in January. You can do it February. You know, those cold winter months, it's going to be something that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, it can be anytime during the year. And so it does, the code.org stuff is up all year round for yep. for that hour of code. You can just jump in whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. What are the themes for, I should ask this earlier, but um, so I was on there the other day. It's still, Minecraft is still on there. Mm -hmm. right? They have a new Minecraft one this right. year. Okay. Yep. Um, anything, what else? They added Moana. I don't oh, remember I if that was see, last year yeah. or sometime I didn't see between. Moana, but I, of course, went into the Minecraft one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, no Star Wars this year. There's a new Star Wars movie coming out. Oh, maybe that'll be next year's. Yeah. They have a Star Wars one, but it was like BB-8 and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Um, what about like uh, going beyond the era of code? There's there's resources for people on that code.org site, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. It's full of ideas and resources, probably more than I could share. Um, yeah, like I said, there's the how-to um, if you're having an event, we're encouraging people to invite um, like state legislators, administrators, mm -hmm. just to educate people on what students are doing. And it's really cool for them to see the kids interacting. Um, we like to try and pair up the students with an adult and have them teach them how to code um, because then they can see how the students are engaged and how they're working through that problem solving process. Um, next week, I'll be going to Des Moines East High School and doing an event there with some state legislators nice. and Department of Ed people. So I'm excited for them to see what their class has been doing with high schoolers. Um, okay. They have an AP computer science principals class, and they've doubled their enrollment really? since last wow. year. And it's a lot of students that this is the first AP class they've ever taken. Mm. So they've made some huge progress um, just in one year with that, and so it's exciting. Yeah, and if you go on the code.org site, there's a, they have all these statistics and things on there, and one of them is about like the number of jobs that are going unfilled because we don't have people qualified mm -hmm. to, to fill them in, in computer science area. And I don't think a lot of these necessarily, these adults and people that are coming to visit know that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. to, so to see that in action and see it at a kind of grassroots level, I think that's, that's good for those people, for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things I like about the Code.org um, program is that they have this, um, like, a teacher dashboard mm -hmm. area that when you have all your kids enrolled, that um, you can keep a track of, of where everybody is and see what everybody's doing. But at the same time, the kids can also, like, move at their own pace. Right. And so if you've got kids that are really just eating this stuff up, they don't have to wait for the teacher to say okay mm -hmm. and today we're doing lesson two or whatever because yeah, right. they can just move on to lesson eight or nine and mm -hmm. you know at Grant Wood right now we're doing this uh, well you're part of that blended learning thing mm -hmm. where <laughs> we are trying to encourage teachers to let kids work more at their own pace and to personalize the the learning right. that they want to get at to and so I think that really helps reinforce that kind of idea too. Yeah, it's nice because it's all taken care of you. That's the hard thing about being a teacher is yeah. finding ways to create all of that. And But this is all done and free and mm -hmm. check it out. Yep. And it works for teachers to integrate things if they really like doing like video editing and they want to mm -hmm. fit that in somewhere. Yeah. Um, they can still do that. They don't have to follow everything mm -hmm. step by step, but it is there. And, and like you said, you can track where the students are, but you mm. can also prevent them from going too far ahead because you can hide lessons from them oh, I so didn't that know they that. don't finish like the entire year <laughs> <Right>. in the <laughs> first three months of the school year, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and you can also assign them or make available like extra things that aren't part of the typical lesson. Mm. So if a student's done with a with like the main part that you've asked them to do, they can have some like extensions that go beyond that. But if a student doesn't get there, they don't feel like they've lost out yeah, and right. are missing it. So there's three official kind of um, 
like stages for the code org thing now, isn't there? I think mm-hmm. when we last talked, one of them might have been in beta a little bit or something. Yeah. yeah, but one for elementary, middle, and high school. Is that right? Yep. Yep. So CS Fundamentals, which is Computer Science Fundamentals, is K-5. They've restructured that a little bit over the summer. Um, it used to be A through F, and they still have that, but it's now um, assigned to kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So for the elementary schools, you can go in and find that grade level, and they can start at any point if they missed the kindergarten, first grade ones. It's not like they can't start. Mm-hmm. Um, CS Discoveries is the – we kind of talk about the middle school one, but it actually works for grades 6 through 10, so it could also be an introductory course in high school level as well, Okay, especially if schools – in the district haven't had computer science in right. middle school, it's a great entry point for high schools, um, and then they could move it down. That was the one that was in beta last year. Um, this is the first full year um, that teachers are using the entire curriculum, and it's getting a lot of good responses. Good. And Code.org is very good about tweaking stuff, so anything that's not quite working well, mm-hmm. they go in and they zip it up and fix it. Mm-hmm. And then CS Principles is the high school that can be introductory or AP level. Hmm. Hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I should <clears throat> probably just work my way through the fundamentals. Kindergarten and just there you go. work my way through. <laughs> You'll be in. I might. Uh, yeah. I might. Yeah. Just yeah. take some time. Sure. You'll be coding Next apps. time we talk to Samantha, I'll be talking <laughs> Python. Right. Right? Is that the right? Yeah. It's Python sure. is a word, right? <laughs> yes. You don't like snakes, though, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I hate snakes. <laughs> All right, Samantha, uh, where could uh, people find all the good work that you're doing or, or find you online and get in touch with you and ask you to come into their school and do all that good stuff mm-hmm. that you have lots of time for? <laughs> yeah, so they can email me at samantha at nubo.co. They can find more information on nubo.co online. Um, my personal Twitter account is Dalby S, D-A-H-L-B-Y-S. Um, and I'm on Facebook as well. Or um, Imagination Iowa or Nubo Co. on Twitter. And okay. I try and track both of those or someone will send it my way if I miss it. Nice. Just look for her online. You'll find her. You're she's out there. Yeah, just <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> she's there. Yeah, she's everywhere. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. It's thank been uh, great to talk to you. And we'll, uh, we'll come back when you win some more awards. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> All right, now on to my favorite part of the show, Tech Nuggets. Who's going first today? Uh, how about I go first okay. today? Because normally you go first. I do. I think so. Mm. Okay, so my first Tech Nugget is something I learned from um, someone I follow online, Mike Taylor, who wrote a blog post, How to Access Linda Courses for Free. Now, he's referring to uh, the lynda.com website, which is now owned by LinkedIn, which is now owned by Microsoft, I oh. think. And that's Lynda, L-Y-N-D-A. Yeah, L-Y-N-D-A. So if you're Googling it, L-Y-N-D-A.com. Lynda.com. So okay. it's, it's a website that's been around for a while now. They have all kinds of video tutorials and courses that you can take. And normally this is like a paid subscription mm-hmm. um, that... I think it's up to like $30 a month or something like that. So it's not like a cheap one either. But um, when I read this blog post, I was like, is this one of those clickbait headlines that says, you know, how to do this for free? And it's not really free, but well, it kind of is. And apparently there's a lot of libraries, local libraries that subscribe to Linda on your behalf. And so if you check with your local library, um, which I happen to do, Cedar Rapids Library is... Uh, it's about as local as it gets to where I live. I have a, a membership card for there. Um, Cedar Rapids Library subscribes to lynda.com, so all I need to do is put in my library card number, and I have what looks like full access to the lynda.com uh, suite of online videos and courses. So if it's ever something you've thought about and thought, well, you know, I'd like to try that sometime or take a look, they have courses on all kinds of stuff from photography, technology, business, social media, you know, all kinds of technology related things you will find there and uh, definitely worth a look. Yeah, I had never heard of Linda. Before. You'd never heard of Linda.com no, before? I think I actually said, who's Linda? What, what are we talking about here? They are very high quality professional uh, videos. There's some education ones on there. I yeah. checked out they have an education technology section oh. where you can go and learn about Google Classroom and are different you on things there? like that. I am not on there. Oh, no. should you be? 
Well, I don't know. You're going to put in a request. I'm not going to put a request on, but... Excuse me, Linda. I think I should be on your website. I don't know if Linda's a real person or not. (laughs) We're going to figure out who Linda is and get back to you. That's follow-up. That's your homework. My homework is... We're going to find out who is Linda. Who is Linda. Okay. Okay. It's on my to-do list. All right. So, um, my tech nugget is maybe an oldie but a goodie, um, and kind of staying with the same thought that we should use the technology we have, just use it better. Um, I had shared how to do an undo send in your Gmail with some teachers, like, I don't know, like a month and a half ago or something, and they did not know it existed. And I thought, this is a great tool. Um, So what happens with an undo send, if you want to add it to your Gmail, you have to go to your settings, which is like the little widget over on the right-hand side. Um, And it's in the first general tab, and that's where it defaults to, is where you go. Um, And then the fifth one down is undo send. And you can choose to turn on an undo send for 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, or five seconds. And what it does is it delays your email from being sent. And then there's a little prompt that pops up kind of at the top of your inbox that says um, undo or something like that. Isn't that what it says? Undo? Undo send. Undo send, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so... I am one of these people that will send an email off pretty quickly and then I'll be like, oh, I forgot to add that. So instead of cluttering up someone's inbox with two or three emails from me, um, I hit undo send and it it pulls that email back into my inbox um, where I can add or maybe completely delete the email if you're one of those people. Yeah. (laughs) I know this has saved me a lot because I have had to recall emails almost specifically because I've written something like, oh, see the attached file here. Right, and yes. And then, oh, I, I didn't forget. I forgot to attach it. Exactly. <laughs> so that is probably my number one cause. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. It's very useful. It is. Um, one thing, though, that I notice and I always tell people, too, is like if you're sitting next to one, someone and you're like, I'm going to send this to you, and it doesn't – it. You have to remember, like, and then they'll be like, I'm not getting your email. I'm not getting your email. Well, it's because it takes that delay yes. is a delay, so it's not being sent. So you will have a little bit of a delay in your emails, but um, only up to 30 seconds. So, And I have it on full throttle. Full 30 seconds? Yeah, full 30-second <laughs> throttle. Yeah, it's... It's a little little misleading because it doesn't really undo a send. It doesn't right. send it and it just pull doesn't it back. Send it. It's kind of delay send. Right. But yeah, it's it's a good tool. I yes. like it a lot. Yep. All right, real time follow up for you. Okay. Linda Susan Weinman is an American business owner, computer okay. instructor, and author who founded an online software training website, Linda dot com, with her husband. Linda was acquired by online business network LinkedIn in April 2015 for $1.5 billion. Oh, shut the front door. Yeah. We need to come up with something like that. We could be podcasting in Hawaii right now. If we came up with something that earned $1.5 billion, I don't think we'd be podcasting. You don't think so? We definitely wouldn't be together. Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) We could get really far away from each other with $1.5 billion. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. Next on the list, then, I have uh, an extension, a browser extension that works in Chrome or Firefox. It might work in other browsers, too, but that's the only two I've tried it on. And it's the IORAD Tutorial Builder. Mm -hmm. Unusual name, Mm I-O-R-A-D, IORAD Tutorial Builder. And I was playing with this earlier and uh, sent some to Mindy. Yeah. But it's kind of a cool tool. What it does and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this is you go to a website that you would like to explain or have somebody follow through some steps on how to do something and then you turn on the IORAD extension and it basically records everything you do on the screen kind of like a screencast but it does it in um, like screenshots Mm -hmm. and everywhere you click or hover your mouse it will record and after you've gone through the process of like you know this is how to insert an image in google docs you go to insert you choose image you go over to the search bar you choose your image you drag it over it records all of that and breaks it up into small steps so that when you send the link to somebody it says step one click on insert Mm -hmm. and then it shows you where to click it highlights Mm -hmm. the insert part on the page and then um, you go to step two and it says click 
image or whatever it is and it just walks you through it step by step so if you are a tech coach or instructional coach and somebody's like oh hey how did you do that thing again mm -hmm. you could do a quick screencast if you wanted to or you could just do this very quick um thing with iorad it doesn't even require any audio it's not a video it's just a link to an online tutorial that you can make with uh, your computer yeah so i wonder if it's more like an overlay do you think that's what that link is? It's I think just it's more, more like an, kind of like a, like an annotation-type yeah. overlay on there. But. It's neat. I'll put your example maybe on the show notes so people can see it. Yeah. and it, it I think you have to see it to understand it. Yeah, it also gives you like a kind of printable PDF mm -hmm. style as well. And it puts all the like words on. And so it knows what website you're going to. So it will say something like, okay, so the first step is to go to grantwoodaea.com and click on this. And it will... You don't have to type any of that stuff. Then mm -hmm. it says, then click on, yeah. and it will put in the words for you. So it's yeah. neat. It is neat. All right. So I came across um, a blog post just, I think, yesterday by Shelly Terrell. And um, what I liked about this is that she's using a um, pretty solid tool that I really enjoy, which is called Thing Link. And what she did with the Thing Link is she imported a calendar as the background in Thing Link. And then each day has a hotspot on it. So I think what she's doing with it here is creating like an advent calendar of mm -hmm. sorts. Um, but I thought it was just kind of an interesting twist on a digital calendar. So um, even if you didn't want to do an advent calendar or something like that or a holiday calendar, uh, just the idea of putting um, having a digital calendar for your students and then they can go into each day and maybe see, you know, what the learning goals for that day are or something like that. Um, I, I just I like to see tools being used in a different way. And I thought this was a um, good example of that. Yeah, I like that. I mean, like even in my kids' school, they have like their specials on rotation. So, you know, mm -hmm. when are we next doing PE or when are we right. next doing music and, yep. and that kind of stuff. That's a neat idea. Mm -hmm. I like it. I do too. It goes back to what we were talking about on that last podcast of just using the tools that we already know better right. as opposed to looking for Something brand new. new tools. Yeah. All right. All right. Good one. Mine's quick too. Um, and it is another browser related um, tool here. I happen to use a browser that I know is not uh, particularly one of the more popular browsers these days. What, I, what browser would that be, Jonathan Wiley? Well, it's not like a completely unique or unheard of browser, but I'm a Firefox user and have right. been for some time. Uh, Firefox just came out with a big update. If you've really? never gone back to Firefox for a while, it's really very fast, very clean, very modern. It's called Firefox Quantum. Version 57 plus um, is is well worth checking out if you haven't been uh, on Firefox for a while. Go and update your browser. But that's not really what I'm here to talk about because uh, I found a Firefox extension called Foxified. <laughs> I was continue, waiting. continue, okay. sir. <laughs> Foxified is a browser extension that for Firefox that once you install it, it lets you use Chrome extensions on Firefox. Oh, I heard you quietly exclaim something about that the other day at your desk. You can get the best of both worlds. Yeah. You can get all those good Chrome extensions you like, mm -hmm. but have them on Firefox. Yeah. So there's not a lot of extensions I are missing Like when I use Firefox, because Firefox have their own extensions gallery, and you can go back and search for all of those. So you can basically find most of the stuff you want and need. But every so often, there's like one thing that mm -hmm. is only made for Google Chrome. Right. And um, those are the ones that you now have access to if oh, you good. install the Foxified Firefox add-on. It's foxy. I like it. I bet you do. Okay, so my last tech nugget today is called um, Kidlit TV. And um, I was actually looking for, I don't, I don't know how I came across this, but um, what I think is interesting about it is that there is a little podcast built into Kidlit um, TV called Kidlit, Kidlit Radio. And actually the podcast itself, I think is called Story Nori. So you can find it on um, you know, in your podcast app or whatever. Uh, but they are little short stories just that you can um, listen to. So they're no longer than two or three minutes. And um, there are actually books being read. Then um, 
within the Kid Lit TV, there is also um, with each podcast or each little story, a little tutorial of how to um, draw the main character of that story. So like if the main character is a lion, there's a little tutorial of how you can draw a lion, Hmm. which my daughter would love because she's kind of a little artist. Um, So I like that. There is also um, a section called Story Makers, and they are interviews with the authors of different stories. So if you are doing an author study or something like that, you can um, look here to just kind of you know, listen to the story makers or the authors talk about their books. And I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a nice uh, little website just with some different things. And I hadn't seen it before. And I was always myself looking for um, places where students could listen to stories. If you're daily five user um, and listen to reading is always one of those um, sections in daily five that i thought oh this would be a nice little place that students could go and listen to stories so take a look at that one kidlit.tv yeah it's a winner of the parents choice gold award and one of american library associations great websites for kids and also recommended by me which Uh, award-winning of the edtech takeout yes there you go (laughs) So that's all we have time for today. As always, we will have links to all the resources in our show notes for this episode, which you can find online at dlgwaea.org forward slash podcast. You can email the show podcast at gwaea.org, but not many people do. Um, (laughs) You can also find us on social media because that's where people do give us feedback and shout outs on the show. Uh, Mindy is at Team Carney and uh, I am at Jonathan Wiley. I'm on Snapchat. We need to add that into our outro. Outro. I'm Carney Ten on Snapchat. Okay, do you want me to start again? No, just keep going. Okay. Okay. Until next time. This has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org/podcast. dot org slash podcast.